Professor Cross, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Matt. Why don't we start with your career? Where'd you start off? Uh, what have you been doing uh, since the beginning and where are you now? Well, uh, I grew up in a small rural working class county in, in central Pennsylvania and decided I was going to go off to the, the big city uh, for college. So I went to, to Hofstra. Now to us, Long Island and Manhattan were all the same thing. Um, so it was a big city nonetheless. Um, but while there, I realized I really had a passion for understanding how political institutions and institutions in general operate, uh, and namely how they can be improved. Uh, and so I decided well, I should go to grad school. Um, I was very fortunate to get into the University of Michigan's uh, PhD program in political science, uh, and that is where I earned a PhD in political science. Uh, my dissertation was on uh, in how intense competition between political parties can distort the policymaking process. And this is where I also began a longstanding research project on congressional staff and expertise. Um, after that, I took a, a great a job at a really great liberal arts college down in San Antonio, Texas, uh, Trinity University, uh, the first year of which I actually spent as a fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton. Uh, and just this year, I accepted a new position as assistant professor of political science here at uh, Purdue University in West Lafayette, uh, which is where I'm sitting uh, now today and enjoying uh, my new colleagues. So that's uh, that's how I got where I'm at today. Great. So why don't we uh, start the conversation? You, you said you're interested in political institutions. What got you turned on to that area and what general kind of what's the general research direction that, that that's taken you in? Yeah, I, I realized that so much of what drove my interest in politics, I, as many other political scientists, I, I took an interest in politics and political television, all that sort of thing from a young age. But I realized so much of what drove my interest in it was that contrary to what popular media says, where everything is so personality driven and person driven, that really it's the rules of the game that determine the type of game you're going to end up with. I didn't know that was political science until I got into college. And I said, holy cow, I can study these rules and the interesting behavioral implications that they have and how they structure human interaction and that sort of thing. I can study that as a career. And so uh, that's what I decided to study. Now, uh, when I got to graduate school, um, a, a new way of thinking of, uh, of political institutions was sort of coming down the pike, that being understanding congressional behavior in particular as uh, sort of the function of insecure majorities. And that's really the direction that a lot of my research took. And so if I were to summarize my, my research interests really in one sentence, it would be, I'm interested in why and how intense and evenly matched uh, partisan competition has really transformed nearly every facet of American governance. Um, just to give you a better idea of how that plays out, I'm interested in how it's distorted policymakers' incentives to change policy, how it has altered behavioral and organizational nature of uh, private interests and interest groups, and then finally, how it's undercut congressional investments in themselves, investments in expertise. So, you know, it's a it's a nice overview, and we've talked with uh, Francis Lee on the program in the past, where you know we've talked about this concept of unstable majorities and in, in the kind of um, institutional changes it, it brings about. Uh, it sounds like you've taken that, you know, and, and gone deeper in particular areas or particular implications. So why don't we start off with the first one you mentioned, which is this concept of incentives. Um, you know, what, how does it change the game for incentives, whether you have, you know, a huge majority a two thirds versus, you know, you're, you're on the, on the edge of a 51, 49 kind of scenario. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, in research that I've done, I, I've tried to demonstrate this game theoretically, um, but I can give you the Cliff Notes version because the, the logic really is, is pretty straightforward. The idea is that when Congress can change hands really at any given time, any two year period, people who are in charge of what Congress is considering, so I think party leaders to a lesser extent committee leaders, they have a strategic decision to make, which is do I make policy now or do I wait two years to make policy? And what happens is if you can gain majorities, say, in the other chamber, or if you can gain control of the presidency, it changes your strategic environment. You think, yeah, I can get something good today. But if I wait just a, a year or two short years, I can get something better tomorrow. And so what I showed both theoretically and empirically with some new data uh, within this project is that party leaders are actually foregoing policy changes 
that they that they actually like, that they prefer to the status quo, policy changes that would pass if they were brought up for a vote, they're blocking those on the hope that they can do something more, something closer to their ideal policy after the upcoming election. So it's not just about polarization that we're seeing all this gridlock in Washington. It's really about the timing of these elections and how uh, party leaders are trying to game that out. So that's pretty interesting, you know, because when I think about this notion of the party delaying something or not doing something, usually what I would think, my first thought would be they're putting their own interest above the country interest, right? Uh, they're, they're basically uh, superseding the, their duty as representatives because of loyalty to a faction. Right. But it sounds like the argument you're making is that, in fact, that's not what they're doing. They're gambling um, uncertainty of the future on a bigger potential payout in the future. And so you could make an argument that they still feel like they're serving the country rather than their party. It's just that they're gambling that in a future state, they'll have more power than they do now and can implement those things. I think that's exactly right. Um, now, we could have an argument about whether that's how they would uh, defend this decision. Um, but if you talk to party activists, if you talk to people who are sort of at the heart of these party offices, it's exactly the type of thing that they'll say. They'll say, look, we can hit a bunt single today, or we can hold out and hit a home run in you know two years, four years, six years. Now, the problem is, is if you iterate that game, if every two years you say, well, I'll just wait, I'll just wait, I'll just wait, nothing ever gets done, right? Because we're stuck in this, in, in, in this cycle where Democrats feel like they can regain control of this, that, or the other thing, and Republicans feel the same way. And so no one ever actually gets to that stage where they can hit that home run. And I apologize for the baseball analogies. I am a Phillies fan, and we're presently uh, tied 2-2. Uh, in, in the series. Um, and so uh, this is sort of the upshot of this project is that you can have people that are still policy motivated. They don't just have to be politically motivated. They are policy motivated. And yet you get gridlock. See, I would almost think that the, it would seem to me that it would almost be the opposite scenario. Like if it's unstable, if you know your party's control is unstable, wouldn't you want to get things done while you've got the power? It would imply that it's unstable, but they don't get that it's unstable. They, they're they optimists about the, they, they overestimate their chances of being in control in two years compared to the true state of things. Is that, is that accurate? It is absolutely accurate. So the, the other, the flip side of the theory and the flip side of the empirics that I've done in this work is there are some conditions under which party leaders face an incentive to what I would call accelerate policymaking rather than decelerate it. So some examples of this include um, Republicans before the 2016 election. I mean, everybody thought that Trump was going to get waxed. Everybody thought that Republicans were going to lose the Senate. And of course, that's not what happened. But if you look, say, at betting markets and polls and things like that prior, that's what everyone thought. And so you saw things like the education bill being pushed through for the first time in seven years after the reauthorization had expired. You see other actually fairly substantial pieces of legislation getting pushed through at a time in a presidency that's not typically known as being especially productive. So you do see this from time to time. Conversely, if you go back eight years before then, where uh, Bush is sort of at the tail end of his uh, tenure, everybody knew Democrats were going to win power was going to flip. And so even though Republicans wanted to push stuff through, there was no way they were getting it through, right? Because Democrats knew, forget about it. We're waiting until we have, at that time, of course, they thought it would be Hillary Clinton, but we're waiting until we have our person in office and then we'll deal with these problems. So yes, it can cut both ways. The problem is because we have separation of powers, even when you want to accelerate, you're often not able to do so, right? Because somebody else is at a veto point. Whereas it's always easy to slow things down in our system because that's the way it's designed. So do you think that today the different parties overestimate their chances in the next election? Is that a common affliction? I, I, I suspect that that's probably the case, but that's, first of all, it's really hard to measure. Uh, I've tried to do it a little bit in my work. Um, 
and it is certainly the case that they don't always get it right. Um, I, one just very small research thing that bugs me is when, when people try to measure how close an election is and how that in, influences politicians' behavior, they always measure it after the fact by the actual outcomes, but that's not the strategic incentives that the politicians are dealing with in the moment. You really need something contemporaneous. That's why I'm actually a big believer in using things like the stock market, betting markets for, uh, for these uh, uh, you know, races and things like that. Uh, to really capture what the contemporaneous beliefs were. Um, and, and yes, I mean, there is certainly this sense that, yes, we can do it. And the, the reason I think that maybe it, they are, I hate, hesitate to say it irrational, but they constantly have to be selling that message in order to, fund, to fundraise, right? You know, if you only give us 10 more dollars or 10,000 more dollars or whatever else, we will take the nation back. And it's every two years. And so, I mean, the more often you say something, the more likely you are I think to believe it. And um, so it, it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case, but I would say that I don't think that has to be the case in order for these sort of weird incentive distortions that I'm talking about here to transpire. And how does it, I mean, I can see how that could play out in the house. What about in the Senate side, since, you know, the timeframes are longer, change is slower, and, you know, you, obviously you still have this, you know, very cl- you know, razor thin margin, yeah. Um, how does your theory apply to the Senate? So, so theoretically, it should apply the same to the House and the Senate. In empirically, in practice, um, it's a little bit harder to set the agenda in the Senate than it is in the House. I mean, if the Speaker says you're not voting on something in the House, you're not voting on it. Forget about it. Um, the Senate, they have to do a little bit more fancy footwork, fill the amendment tree, all this kind of thing. Nevertheless, when you have somebody like say Mitch McConnell, who for you know all the complaints that people may have about him, both Republican and Democrat, he's really good at his job in terms of controlling what goes in and out of, of the Senate. Um, and so the theory really can still apply to the Senate. And normally, even though the founders would have assumed that the Senate actually changes hands less frequently than the House, I mean, the whole idea was the House was supposed to be thermostatic and the Senate was supposed to cool things down. Historically, what we see, it's much more common for the Senate to change hands than the house. And the reason is really simple, and it's a simple mathematical principle, that the larger the districts that you have, the more diverse the districts are, and the more uh, marginal they're going to be on average. So if you have whole states, they're just more likely to be more competitive than tiny districts where likes live near likes. So that was something that even though the, the, the founders were actually pretty good political scientists in some way, it was a mistake. They didn't really realize this And so, yeah, the Senate still changes hands a lot of times, especially within the last hundred years, there are times when the Senate changes and the House never gets close. So in the 80s and so on and so forth, uh, this would be a a great example of that. Interesting. And does it have, and does the Senate calculation change at all because of the filibuster uh, and, you know, the threshold to get legislation through, does that change the game? So actually, I think it changes the game in the House and the Senate because, um, sometimes you can have, say, the House or the Senate in, in, in periods of non-polarization where the two parties are close together. Sometimes you can have control switch in one chamber or the other, and it really doesn't matter because still the pivotal actor that needs to be convinced for policy to change is that filibuster pivot, whether it be a Republican or a Democrat. Today, because the parties are so far apart, Um, Yes, the filibuster is still a bottleneck, and it's something that policymakers need to anticipate when they're trying to change the status quo. They have so many other things to deal with before it ever even gets to the filibuster um, that they often don't even have to, that's not the thing that stops them, in other words. Um, Not the least of which, of course, is the president. I mean, presidents, we generally think of as playing it down the middle more than Congress in some ways, but that just has not been the case um, in, in, in recent years, at least not to the extent that it was, say, in the mid-20th century. So you talk about the concept of incentives. It, it sounds to me like the incentives that you we've discussed so far are mainly focused on leadership, right? The, the speaker or whoever, whatever you call leadership in the Senate, right? Um, what about committees and what about individual members? How does it shape their incentives, if at all? Sure. So uh, it, it Basically, right now, I would argue that Congress is operating in a very top-down way, so that anything that influences the party's uh, fate at the top line is going to trickle its way down 
to the organizational structures within Congress and then eventually down to the individual members. So for, uh, for committees, for example, in order to make sure that everybody is rowing in the same direction in this race or fighting the same battle, whatever metaphor you wanna use, party leaders have really gotten control They've always had control of committee assignments, but they've really used control of committee assignments within basically since at least since Gingrich, if not a little bit before then. And so even though committees are generally seen as a counterbalance to party leadership, they've really been brought into alignment to where you need to be a good fundraiser for the party, you need to be loyal in your in your roll call votes and your co-sponsor behavior and so on and so forth, so that they're not really a counterbalance anymore to party leaders. Uh, it, the same goes for individual members of Congress. So in some other research that I've done on uh, congressional staff and, and investment and policy expertise, members as early as the 1990s were basically told by party leadership, don't worry about this complicated policy making thing. It's multipolar, it's complicated, it's boring. Your constituents don't really care about it. What you need to do is make sure you get reelected so that we stay in power and can do all the conservative or liberal things that we wanna do. And so initially the idea was go back to your district, spend time there, glad hand, make sure they know your name, know your face, all that kind of thing. Today it's less that and more, make sure you get on Fox News or MSNBC and, uh, and talk and talk and talk and make sure that you're getting our brand out there. And so it's really led to a de-emphasis, in my opinion, a, a de-emphasis of committees and committee work, which in turn has made it less attractive to work there uh, for the, the best minds in, in Washington. Um, and also really de-emphasize the importance of policy for individual legislators. All right, well, let's move on to the, the notion of, um you know, private actors and organizations. And, you know, I think the second point is you mentioned, how does this unstable majorities concept impact these private actors or these influencers of policy? What's changed? Is it, you know, is it, how would that change what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Does it mean just they spend all their money and time trying to influence the leaders? You know, is that where we're going with it? Or is, is it do something else? So unexpected? there's that, yeah, there's definitely that part. They've definitely been much more of a focus of lobbyists and, and uh, campaign financers. And there's other work that has has documented that. Really in our work, uh, our work grows out of a recent paper that we had in the American Political Science Review, where uh, we generate a measure, uh, a left-right ideological measure of interest groups that allows us to compare them directly to members of Congress. And what we find surprisingly um, is that even though you think about interest groups and private interests as being really parochial, right? They care about one issue or one perspective. They don't really care about partisan politics. They're not necessarily ideological. We kind of find the opposite, actually, that all of the position taking that these private interests do fall pretty cleanly into partisan bins. That is, these special interests look every bit as programmatic um, and ideological as the partisans in Congress. And this really runs contra to basically everything that we thought we knew about special interests uh, since people were studying them. Um, and so uh, my co-authors and I, Xander Furness at Northwestern and uh, Jeff Lorenz at, uh, at Nebraska, uh, we've embarked on uh, a data collection mission, which uh, is culminating in a book trying to both document this trend uh, when it happened um, and uh, but but more importantly, why it happened and what could be done, because we actually think it's it's pretty problematic uh, along many dimensions. Um, and so, just to give you a sense of why we think this is happening, our hypothesis is that because Congress is so oriented toward party competition. They are, as I believe Dr. Lee has, has said in some of her writings, single-minded seekers of majorities rather than re-election <laughs> or in addition to re-election, um, that in order for a private interest to get access to the member's office, members are basically saying, uh -uh, you got to play the partisan game in order for me to talk to you. You need to show me that you're not aiding and abetting the enemy before I'm going to work with you on the issue that you care about. One way for groups to do this is for them to take party line positions on issues they don't really care about. In other words, carry the party's water on non-central issues. You sometimes hear this called mission creep, but rather than just being sort of something that happens for who knows what reason, we actually argue this is a strategic response to an increasingly partisan environment 
in Washington. And what our results are suggesting is that not only has this grown since the 1980s when people say the era of insecure majorities began, but that really it is being driven by these considerations of party brand and party uh, brand differentiation that are endemic to comp uh, competition. So for example, we show that uh, whenever one uh, a group's core issue becomes especially tied to the party brand, so think gun issues for Republicans, environmentalism for Democrats, that those groups are much more likely to engage in mission creep than others are. Uh, and so we really think that it's changing the nature of the, the special nature of, of special interests, which are generally seen as counterbalances to these broader polarizing features and actually making them part of the problem, in other words. I wonder, that, that's a very interesting observation. And I wonder, you know, have you looked into the cause of it? Is it is it because of you know they the, the the institutions themselves need to align themselves with the parties, or is it that the people that they hire are already kind of infected with the disease, right? And they bring the disease into the institution. I think the answer almost certainly has to be both. And a long term um, a goal for us is to try to so for for those of you. Uh, watching, and I know for you, Matt, you grew up around DC, so you probably remember the K Street Project from the 90s, where this was exactly the goal, right? It was to stack lobbyist office with, with movement conservatives from the Contract with America offices and so on and so forth. Um, now, the Contract with America is considered by a lot of people to be a failure, and so that's why I sort of doubt that this is the primary thing that's driving this mission creep, but it's something that we can put to the test. We have data on who is revolved in and out of Congress and when they did it. And so it's something that with good data, we can actually put to the test. Are there culture influencers that when they revolve out, they're bringing their very programmatic team-based mindset with them? Now, they'll never admit that. I mean, I, I've interviewed hundreds of lobbyists uh, in my career. And to a person, I mean, you could be at NARAL Pro-Choice, the you know, Chamber of Commerce, Business Roundtable, it doesn't matter where you're at, they'll all say, I am a nonpartisan. I only care about policy. Now that last part is right. They really do only care about policy. I do believe that. Um, but how they get that policy has really, really changed since the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s. Yeah, it reminds me of the and I don't recall exactly who it is, maybe you will, the, um, who, who talks about how the, a lot of those Gingrich Republicans, when they went to the Senate, they brought the, their tactics and their culture over to the Senate. And that's what uh, changed the Senate's culture over time. Yeah, Steve Smith has made arguments along, along these lines for sure. And, and he's had a lot of students over the years um, talk about the Gingrich revolution. But, but yes, there, there's undoubtedly a personnel angle here. I'm certainly not, not one of those people who thinks that there's only one explanation to any problem. I think there's usually multiple ones that work together, um, but it is something we're really interested in examining in the future. I'd be curious also to learn more about the financing environment um, or the donation environment around the institutes and the think tanks, right? Because even in my own experience, I've seen quite a polarized landscape of donors, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Something that surprised me getting into this area, you know, I, I thought I assumed that donors would be sort of party agnostic. They, they're looking for an outcome. But in fact, uh, most of them seem to be very tightly aligned with one position, one party or another. Um, have, have you looked in that as in the research as a, as a driving factor? So, so. Yes and no. Um, for the no, my colleague Xander Furness has worked a lot with uh, interlocking boards and things like that and how that influences the sorts of ideas um, that, that think tanks um, produce, think that, that you know, issues they, they pursue. I, I remember when I was interviewing lobbyists in 2015 in Washington, the big issue, I mean, it seems, seems kind of quaint now, but the big issue then was the XM Bank. And it was this huge problem that it wasn't get reauthorized. And I'll be honest with you, at the time I was in grad school, I did not know what the XM Bank was. So I'm like trying to get myself up to speed with it. I suspect that if I didn't know what it, what it was, um, that your regular Joe probably didn't know what it was either. And I remember thinking, why on earth do they care so much about the XM Bank? Like I get the philosophical argument for it, you know, they framed it in terms of cronyism or whatever, uh, whatever the frame was, 
that made sense politically, but but I didn't understand why that was what they were spending their political capital on until I found out that there were funders at a particular think tank that really, really cared about this and were pushing on it hard. Um, and it was sort of a perfect issue for them because it was both sort of outcome convenient, I'll call it, but it was also ideologically consistent. Um, and it really, it really was driven by the, the funder environment, at least as far as I could tell in my sort of unsystematic but on the ground observation. Um, now, what I will say is in this book project, we are very interested in whether money can actually insulate you from mission creep. In other words, if I pour all my money into one party's coffer, do they let me alone and sort of let me do my own thing when it comes to po uh, actual position taking, actual policy? And so we find the answer is that, that it depends. It's actually a, a really interesting nonlinear relationship. So whenever your core issue is not super politicized, it's not super tied to one of the party's core issues, it does insulate you. So, you know, basically if I'm interested in, I don't know, biofuels or something like that, and I, you know, it's not really tied to one party or the other, right? Because there's the farming angle, but then there's the enviro angle. I can probably pour my money into one of the party's coffers and they'll leave me alone. But if you're in gun policy, reproductive policy, something that's really tied to the brands, the actually the opposite happens where you're expected not just to be loyal in one area, your position taking, but you're actually expected to be extra loyal in the resource area, in the money area. We sort of think preliminarily, this is why, uh, potentially why a lot of big companies have either dropped out of the campaign finance space altogether or never got into it in the first place because they don't want to play this game. Um, you know, they, they really are interested in outcomes. So we found that to be really interesting um, to see that, that the influence of money is definitely non-monotonic. I mean, it, it really depends on other institutional factors. Interesting. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, a lot more research is certainly is needed there, right? Because, you know, the, the, the problem is, you know, if it's not just a focus of Congress or the individual person, if you have, if you have these think tanks and then you and others, and you have their don they're donating um, the you know, institutions that provide money to them, if they've all been polarized, it gets much more difficult to think about how to get out of the spiral. The spiral is not just the small group; it's the whole orbit. You know, the you know all the other institutions that are circling around it that are part of the problem. Um, and how to get them out of that, it seems seems even more difficult. It's a, it's a very tricky problem. It's a chicken egg problem, um, so to speak. One thing I will say, and this is, I suppose sometimes gets me in trouble, but that's okay, um, which is there's a very popular belief that if we just get money out of politics, if we just stop the special interest from doing this, that, or everything, everything will be all, you know, come up roses. Uh, and I think that's a very misguided view for, for a lot of very practical reasons. But one is that I think we undersell the extent to which the system and system level uh, dynamics and institutional features are actually shaping what the moneyed interests are doing and not the other way around. In other words, a lot of times these interests are operating from a position of weakness and not one of strength. Um, that's why I think we spend a little bit too much energy wringing our hands about well, how do we fix this when really I actually think it's top line problems that help work out problems sort of further down the line. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Um, and when one of the factors here, I think that, that is your third area, right? Which is Congress's ability to in invest in itself as an institution. Because in theory, you know, if Congress invested a ton of money in itself and had its own internal think tanks, it might not need any external think tanks, right? Uh, or if it you know, had its own very robust ability to collect information and do an analytics, that would reduce its dependence on third parties to know what was going on in the environment uh, of its constituents or whatever. So can you talk through how this uh, unstable majority is kind of factors into Congress's ability to get its own house in order? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, from a very early uh, point in my career, I was so interested in this idea of what people on the Hill refer to as brain drain. Um, but what political scientists re refer to as divestment. People in the Hill are much better at naming things. Um, and, you know, it's this idea that there's just not any experts or there are not many experts left on, on the Hill. They work in think tanks, they work for lobbyists, they, they, I don't know, went back to school and became professors, whatever. 
So I wanted to both document this to make sure that it wasn't just sort of pining for the past like we sometimes do, um, but also to try to explain where it was coming from. So uh, me and a, and a team of amazing undergraduates at Michigan and then later on with Tim Lapira at James Madison um, embarked on uh, collecting these data and classifying every single staffer in the house from 1993 forward according to their primary responsibilities. And what we showed in, uh, in a recent paper is that not only is there brain drain, but the reason it seems that the, the reason that's consistent with our evidence, I'll say, is not that any one party is to blame for it. So, you know, one popular explanation is that Gingrich blew up Congress and it's all his fault and that sort of thing. But really that Gingrich, I think, is was the first one to respond to changing incentives, which was that we're moving into this era of insecure majorities. It is our job to build a strong party brand that is differentiated from the opponent. Uh, that allows us to sort of sell our product on the open market, which is elections, right? But it's just simple marketing, right? Um, and win elections and take control of Congress. Um, and one way to do that is to centralize policymaking, make sure there's no surprises from multipolarity, um, and just basically have the members of Congress not worry so much, don't sweat the details, go to the district, make sure you get reelected, get on TV. Do these sorts of things and let the, you know, the policy making up to us, the party. Uh, and we find that the, the evidence is very consistent with that. So new members of Congress, we see an intercept shift. So they're much more likely to invest less in, in policy throughout their career. We also see that Democrats, whenever they come back to power, that they don't do anything differently. Um, it's, so it really isn't, in, in our estimation, a policy difference. And, and this points to one of the challenges of Congress investing in itself, because you can increase the top line amount that you give Congress, the members representational allowance, but it truly is an allowance. It's a top line budget and they can spend it however they want. And if they wanna go flying around the country on a book tour or whatever it is, they can, maybe not a book tour, but they can do that, right? They don't have to spend it on staff and many of them will not spend it on staff. In fact, some may pinch pennies and then send it back to the treasury so that they can write up a press release about how they're saving you know, the country money and so on and so forth. And so one of the things that we want to come out of this project is that we care deeply about expertise in Congress and Congress investing in itself. And in fact, Dr. Lapira has worked for the new committee on the uh, modernization of Congress uh, as a fellow. I mean, we believe very strongly in, in this movement, but we also believe that you, you cannot fix Congress in a vacuum, that it is responding to, uh, to sort of broad incentives and members of Congress are responding to broad incentives. And so if you give them $10 instead of $1 and they're already spending 80 cents on not policy, they're just gonna spend $8 on not policy, right? Um, and so we, we really hope that the future reforms focus on things like staff retention um, or, or you know, having staff effectiveness bonuses or even just getting rid of the top line amount that you're allowed to spend on a single staffer so that they can actually be competitive with, with lobbyists, lobbying firms and things like that. So that's a little bit about where we've gone with that, uh, that project. Happy to talk about where we're going with that. We're doing a lot of ongoing data collection that we hope is useful both to Congress and to scholars, but it's an area that we're really passionate about. So wouldn't another strategy be you know, instead to weaken the notion of party, right? And, you know, or, or reduce the power of parties within the context of the government. And then that would naturally lead towards a bigger investment in policymaking. So I have to be careful in how I answer this because parties for a long time in political science have been uh, the heroes. Um, uh, people think that parties are just great. They encourage, you know, voter turnout. They make it easier for vote people to vote because they summarize complex information and they do do a variety of really important things. But at the end of the day, politics is a big pendulum. We go too far in one direction and we have to correct in the other direction. And that's at a whole variety of things. I think that we are really far on the party power portion of the pendulum. And I'd love to see it swing back to committees, to individual members, so that we can get sort of the, what I would call the Federalist 10 government that we're supposed to have, which is coalitions coalescing around individual issues and strange bedfellows forming around individual issues uh, and creating the cross-cutting cleavages that we have come to celebrate so often in American politics 
compared to, to other countries that, that don't have this system like a Great Britain or, or other parliamentary systems. Uh, but right now we don't have that. We have, as uh, Man and Ornstein would say, we have parliamentary parties in a separation of powers system, right? And that is just creating all, all sorts of problems. Now, I will say, I believe in a previous uh, episode, I'll say of your talks here, Steve Smith and, and others have pointed out the thing that's interesting about Congress, and the thing that the reason that political scientists have always had a fascination with it is they make all their own rules. I mean, the Constitution says almost nothing about how Congress can organize itself. So I can say till I'm blue in the face that I want congressional parties to be weaker. But until and unless I convince Congress itself to weaken itself in terms of its parties to weaken itself, it's not going to happen. It's going to have to come from individual members saying, no, I don't want to give them the power to choose what committee I'm on. No, I don't want them to, you know, be able to compel me to fundraise uh, for the party and all these sorts of things. And as long as we've got this really tight competition, the incentives are for them to do that because it, the only thing that's worse than losing is being in the minority party. Uh, that's a really bad situation to be in in this day and age. So I, I'm curious on the notion of party, right? So for me, when I read the Federalist Papers or I read the Constitution, you know, I don't, like, as you say, the, the party doesn't even exist in there except as an epithet, right, of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it seems to me that most of the academics I've talked to, as you mentioned, they love parties. They, they like to study parties. They like to think about parties. And I think it seems to me there was some movement by academics, you know, 20, 30 years ago to strengthen parties. They thought that was an answer to the ills of the past. And I don't, I've never understood what the attraction is to party from the academic community. Is it, what, why do they think parties are so important or great, you know, maybe it's come for me coming from a natural science background, thinking about evolution, right? I think about very distributed kind of processes, right? You have mm. all these species that have all these different, you know, different environments and they're evolving and it's decentralized to the extreme, right? Whereas it seems to me that a lot of the academics really like this kinds of the centralization, the expertise of the party. And they see that as a, as a good thing. Whereas for me, I see it as a, the opposite of an evolutionary process. It's a more of a top-down kind of crude, uh, crude instrument. So, can you do you think that's correct, or or is there? Am I seeing nothing? Am I seeing something that's not doesn't exist? Well, I would say, in broad strokes, that's correct. I think there are contextual reasons for it, and I would point out that the parties are their own sort of living organisms that that do themselves evolve. So it's not that the parties don't evolve, but I get I understand what you're saying that you know. You want diversity to create better, I don't know, gene pools and so on, and sort of better outcomes and that kind of thing. Uh, and 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 I should preface this by saying, you know, I really come at this as an interest groups guy. Not that I love special interests and money in politics, but that I've always been fascinated by that, and I've I've always been fascinated by how it connects to the vision of democracy that Madison has, um, much better than than parties, which really actually contravene everything that Madison had planned for our democracy. Um, but, and, and so, so I preface to say that if you want a, a really, probably a stronger answer, you're better off asking someone like Seth Maskett or Julia Azari, uh, and, and I can't remember, you may have already uh, interviewed them previously, uh, but they'll, they'll say it more eloquently than I do. But one of the big reasons is that we have this problem in democracy, it's a big problem, where people have day jobs. You know, they, they don't have time to learn about the ins and outs of policy. What is the right thing we should do? How dangerous are nukes? Should we tax more? Should we spend more? I mean, these are big questions, very important questions, but people have to earn a paycheck and provide for their family and have fun. You only live once and so on and so forth. And so you have this problem of what political scientists have called rational ignorance for a very long time. Um, and, and it's a real challenge. How do you keep that from turning into demagoguery and dictatorship and all these other things that we want to avoid? One way is by simplifying the process, by giving people labels that summarize a whole bunch of information and allow them to make a quick but relatively informed decision. And I would say most Americans can point out some key differences between Republicans on one hand and Democrats on another. So even though, you know, probably 85% of Americans and certainly 85% of my undergrads don't know who their member of Congress is, when they go to the ballot box, they see an R or a D, 
and they say, ah, I know which one of those I am. Um, and you know, you could say, well, the alternative is then they would have to learn about their congressman if there wasn't the R and the D, to which I say they wouldn't. <laughs> uh, and I think that that's probably a fair assessment. And you need look only, only as far as nonpartisan city elections in, in many cities and how low turnout those are as evidence, I would say, of this fact. And so this really is an amazing thing that parties do for, for democracy, you know, small d democracy. Um, but as I tell my students all the time, you know, politics is not like economics. Politics is a zero sum game, right? You know, economics is a positive sum game. If I sell you something and you give me your product, I wanted your product more than you than, than I wanted my money and you wanted the money, you know, more than you wanted your extra piece of product, right? We're both better off. Power doesn't work that way. If you have it, I don't. And so that means that in politics, there are no things that are all good or all bad. It really just depends on the situation. And I would say in this situation, in this era of polarization along so many dimensions, not just along ideological dimensions, but along sort of social dimensions, geographic dimensions, all these different dimensions, I don't think having strong parties makes a whole lot of sense at the moment. I would much rather people think about themselves, not as Republicans and Democrats, but as environmentalists or outdoorsmen or heck, even gun owners. You know, you can imagine all these different identities that we have besides Republican and Democrat um, that you could use as heuristics, but that aren't so blunt, like an R and a D, right? Um, and so, so, so I have to say, I'm actually with you there. This, again, this puts me, I know for sure, in the minority um, among political scientists, and that's okay. It's, it's a very fascinating discussion for me, um, and, and I, hope, I hope for others as well. Um, but it, it's an interesting tension, and it has been the case really since the 30s and 40s probably, that people have viewed parties and interest groups as being in this constant tension. And I think that's right. And I think the parties are winning, <laughs> and they're really winning right now. And so maybe it wouldn't be such a bad thing if those scales were perhaps tipped in the other direction. One thing I'll just say here, this is a funny uh, kind of depressing, but I think funny and apt uh, saying that I heard from Ray LaRaja, uh, Ray LaRaja uh, a really terrific campaign finance scholar at uh, UMass Amherst, uh, where he said, uh, you can either have corruption or polarization, one or the other. <laughs> and the idea is there, if you want programmatic parties, you're going to get polarization. You're going to get people thinking of things in simplistic left-right terms. But if you empower interest groups too much, yeah, you're going to get sort of the, the yucky sausage making that people don't like about Congress. So obviously that's a, an oversimplification, but I do think it's, it, it's sort of a humorous and apt description of the trade-offs that we face when we think about who are we giving power to at the higher, highest levels. Great. Well, before we move on to some of the common questions, um, I know you have some ideas on reform and, and how it's worked in the past. You know, can you talk a little bit about those and what have you found there? Yeah, so uh, I have a, a set of projects about popular reforms that, that have been done both at the state and the federal level. Uh, obviously, most of the institutional changes we've seen because of the way the Constitution is written have been at the state level. So most of this stuff has been at the state level. Uh, I have some stuff, some new stuff on uh, term limits. Obviously, political scientists are kind of an opposite lockstep from the public. I think about 85, 80 or 85 percent of the public think we should have term limits, and I would bet at least that many political scientists think we shouldn't. Uh, and so I, I think one of the reasons for that disconnect is um, is that political scientists don't always engage with some of the benefits that people think that they have. Now I, I'll, I'll just say, to be transparent, I still don't want them. I think that they distort things pretty badly. But one of the big arguments that people that the reformers have said for a long time is that they that, that term limits um, weaken special interests. Now, there have been some uh, studies that show that there are conditions under which they strengthen them, but what uh, James Strickland at Arizona State and I have shown is that when um, term limits are instituted, and so turnover is sort of um, uh, artificially in, in, uh, instituted, you actually see fewer of these mega lobbyists in these states. Why? Because the mega lobbyists Think about, it. I mean, how do you sell your product to tobacco producers, you know, corn growers, 
uh, you know, abortion activists and everybody else, there's no substantive link. It's access. They build their firms around being able to get you a meeting with the speaker or get you a meeting with the committee chair or whatever. But if you're forcing those committee chairs and speakers and whoever else to rotate out and your connections are growing stale, it's harder for this business model really to work. And so we show that there's a lot less of this uh, sort of K Street type activity that's called K Street on Main is the name of that paper um, because of this sort of artificial inducement of turnover. Now, I, I probably Professor Strickland and I are, differ on how we think turnover could be instituted. I think that term limits is a bit too blunt, but I do think that thinking about ways to change, in, you know, to, to increase turnover in state legislatures and as well as in Congress, frankly, um, can create better advocacy environments such that interest groups are doing the sort of issue-based things that we want them to do and not the let me sell you 15 minutes of my time stuff that I think, you know, people have been worried about ever since Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Um, so, so that's term limits. I also have a, a, a taken a real interest in the top two primary in Washington and California. I've done a lot of archival research in Washington where it was created. I always like to give a shout out to Sam Reed, the former Secretary of State, and the great folks of Washington. California made it famous, but Washington invented it. Um, and uh, nothing against California, I like California, but they get credit for everything. It really was Washington. Um, th that system has come under a lot of scrutiny, especially from political scientists who, as you've noted, they love parties. And this is a pretty clearly anti-party reform. Um, and uh, I believe I had the first paper to show that when the system operates as it's supposed to, that, uh, that it does in uh, 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 encourage the election of more moderate candidates to the legislature, including to Congress. Um, and, uh, you know, in as much as that's a goal that you have, maybe this is the type of institution that, that you'd like to have. I, I will say one part that I like professionally, but not personally about that paper is I show at the end that the only way this works is if you get people of the same party competing against each other in the general election. Right, because then you're forcing the say Democrats in a super red district to vote for the more moderate candidate. What I show statistically is that this type of competition happens way less than it should if we were just sort of doing it by random draw based on party affiliations in the district. And so I leave it open as to who is pulling the strings to make sure this doesn't happen, but it seems pretty clear that some combination of the party organization, incumbents or both are basically sidestepping this type of competition and making the reform much less effective than what it could be uh, at, at achieving its goals. So I, I think electoral reform is actually a really important component of getting us out of the problem that we're in, but I don't think it is enough on its own to get us there for what it's worth. Got it. So why don't we move on to the questions I ask all our guests, if you're ready to move on to phase two. Sounds good. So the first one here is, what do you think uh, congressional representation should mean? Who are the constituents and how are they, how should they be represented? That's a, it's a great question. I was so glad when I saw this question because I'm literally teaching a class on representation right now uh, called representation, uh, why, what, who, and how. Um, and it's been great fun. And so it's really fresh in my mind. And I start with this observation, which is that we live in an era today that is more complicated than at any point in human history. Every year there are new issues, uh, there are new controversies. These are driven by new technologies, connections, and capabilities we've never had before. And as a result, I think it's really unreasonable to expect the average American citizen to know something about many of the problems, most of the problems with which Congress must deal every day. And so this creates a really big challenge for representative democracy that's more acute now than it's ever been before. And so for representation, what I think we need um, is we need to elect people to office that we can trust not only to act in our own interest as opposed to you know, their own special interests, of course, but really we need people who understand us well enough to be able to reason through new problems in the same way we would if we were privy to the sort of expertise and information that they have. So what I think this means is that we need to have room for expertise. This is very important, but for people in a changing world to really trust what the institution comes up with, I think we need to be careful about having 
people from different walks of life, people from different backgrounds, rep and people from importantly different social perspectives as Iris Young would call them, a political theorist. People that come with all these different starting points to the deliberative process so that whenever you have the deliberative thing going on that the outcome you come out with is not only we know is actually a better product to get back to your evolutionary point, um, but also is something that the public can trust because we are in a period where we, it is, there's way more uncertainties than we've ever had before. Technology is, is taking off at a breakneck pace. And so I really think this trust component is more important than it has ever been before. So it sounds like this trust is, all, is about enabling the, or at least in part is enabling the representative to make judgments about what they think is in the best interests of their constituents, right? So it sounds like you're a judgments guy, uh, a Burkean in terms of judgments. So uh, I, I would say it's probably fair to, if we're gonna put it on a, this sort of uh, a single dimension, Burkean versus whoever you wanna put doll on the other side, I guess, you know, whoever you wanna put on the other side, that's probably right. But what I really think um, uh, truthfully is that most of the time the constituent has no, constituency has no idea what it wants. And that's not because they're dumb. It doesn't mean it's because they're irresponsible. It just means that the world's changing and they just really have uncrystallized views about what ought to happen. And so rather than the, the, you know, the legislator coming in and saying, well, I have these principles and this ideology and this is what we're going to do. What I want them to have is to have grown up around the people that they are representing, to have shared life experiences with the people they're representing so that when they tackle a problem, they see it through their constituency's eyes um, and the relevant portions of that problem are drawn out for them by their experiences in a very natural way, rather than trying to sort of reverse engineer what they think is gonna get them reelected or something like that. So, so I would say it's a bit of a middle ground in some ways between those two, but it's driven by how infrequently people actually know what they want. So you know, there's the, how the representative, how, how the representative, in this case, you've, you've drawn on this notion of the, of the judgments, right? Uh, and it sounds like you're a little bit farther on the judgment scale um, uh, of that, of that, of that axis, right? Um, the other side is who they're representing in the district. You know, there's, there's primary voters, right? There's a party, there's you know, all the citizens of the district, there's every person in the district, there's future generations of the district. So the, no, the concept of representation in, involves which group of people? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so this is the who unit of, of my class. And there's a lot of answers to this, right? I mean, I mean, there's, you've got descriptive representation, you've got, oh, well, we need to, it should be the educated or experts. Of course, that's what J.S. Mill would have said. Uh, there's a lot of ways to answer this question. I'm going to be a throwback here, uh, and by throwback, I mean to like the 1950s, and say that I actually think that the basic units of a political society are our interests, not necessarily interest groups. Interest groups are after they've organized themselves into a, 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 you know, an entity, but people think of themselves as a combination of a bunch of different identities. Now, these could be... Um, racial identities, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever. They could be language groups, they could be gender, but they also are things like occupational groups, income brackets, religion. Uh, and if you think about it, every single person is a fairly unique iteration of all those things. Um, and so what you hope is that when you split the country into these sort of bite-sized pieces, that at least uh, that, that everybody is represented, that every aspect of somebody's sort of social perspective, I'll use that term again, is represented by somebody in the institution. Ideally, it would be the one they're actually voting for, but it doesn't have to be. We, we have a lot of literature to suggest that, for example, Black members of Congress view it as their duty to represent Black people not in their district, and they'll answer phone calls from them and all sorts of other things uh, because they, they view it as being part of their job. And so I, I really think that that at the end of the day, um, and maybe someone will call me an identity politics person, which would be the first time I've ever been called that. But um, at the end of the day, I really think that's the way people think about themselves. It's it's how they lodge their trust in people. And I would like for for members of Congress to and and, and all legislators really to think of themselves in that way too, 
rather than as partisans, rather than as ideologues, but really as agents for uh, the social situations uh, that are represented in this incredible, diverse, and expansive country of ours. So don't you run into the same problem, though, with this notion of interests that you can never really know? Like, if, if you're, you're, you're calling everybody a bundle of identities, right? How can you ever know what those identities are? Just as you don't know, they're just like people don't have beliefs, strong beliefs on a particular issue. Don't you run into the same problem? So um, if I understand your, your question correctly, I would, uh, I'd respond by saying that people, I would say, know who they are a lot better than what they believe. Um, and, and, and all I mean by that is that your social perspective, your combination of identities, group memberships, all this sort of thing, is, is different from interests or opinions or ideologies because it's really the starting point of a deliberation. It's really the starting point of, uh, of thinking about policy. It's just a way that you look at the world. So you're, you, you have a problem, and rather than having a canned answer to that problem, which is what an ideology is, right, uh, or a partisan, you know, a, or a partisanship or even opinion is, um, you're looking at that problem through a certain lens, somebody else is looking at it through, a, and through another lens, and you talk through that problem together. And so that's what I say is the, is the biggest difference is rather than seeing a problem and bang, having a solution because you have some decision rule about it, you're looking at a problem through a certain set of interests and perspectives that allow you to keep those in mind when somebody else's equally legitimate interests and perspectives are also discussing the same topic. Well, that's the, actually the next question that comes up when it comes to these identities. You know, some of them may be... Um, Either they're unknowable, which is kind of what I was referring to before, uh, or they might conflict with each other. And, you know, is are all these interests then represented equally? Or, you know, and what about the future interests that you don't know? Yeah, so the future interests, I have to say, is a tough one. I mean, that that is, it, I'm not a political theorist by trade. I certainly like political theory. Um, but as far as I know, whenever I was studying this stuff in grad school, this is something that's really bedeviled both political theorists and philosophers, by the way. It's like, how do we think about future people? I mean, it's a big challenge, of course, for climate scientists, right? Like, how do we think about harming poor people today versus, like, not killing them in the future because we, we've totally abdicated our duties as, as citizens of the earth? I think it's a similar problem for politics. So I'm not sure I have a great answer for you for you there, to be honest with you, because um, it's hard to think about the perspectives of, of people not yet in existence. Uh, but what I can say is, in terms of, of interest being represented equally, I think that's something that you allow to flow to the surface endogenously through elections. And I, I ultimately, I think what elections then become is about which identities at any point in time do people think are the most relevant to the problems that we face today. So for example, during the recession in you know, 08 and 09, probably people's economic identities were the most important to them. And those were the ones that they wanted to see reflected in their, uh, in their legislators and in, in their politicians. Whereas you know, today after you know, Roe v. Wade uh, being you know, pulled back, um, maybe people view themselves through more gendered lenses or religious lenses or whatever else. Um, so I really think it's something that's endogenous to whatever societal challenges that we're, uh, that we're facing at one point or another. Uh, and, and you're a smart guy, so you're probably thinking, well, isn't that something that politicians can manipulate? And it is. It's 100% something politicians manipulate. I actually think that much of politics is all about trying to get people to think of themselves as a blank rather than another blank. But politics isn't going anywhere, so I suppose that's just the way it's going to be. Sorry. Right, so the next question is: uh, How would your ideal Congress allocate its time in terms of, you know, in D.C. versus in the home district, and you know, dialing for dollars versus versus legislating? Yeah, yeah. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, whenever I teach Congress, I really think constitutionally Congress has three duties: they have duties to legislate, to represent, uh, and to oversee the bureaucracy. Right now, I don't think they do any of those things especially well. I don't think they do enough of any of those things. So the answer is they need to do more of all three of those things. So you, okay, if they're not doing those things, what the heck are they doing? They're doing two things. 
They're giving red meat interviews to cable news and other similar outlets. So they're doing comms, which is nowhere in the constitution. Um, and they're fundraising. And neither one of those things fits cleanly into representation or legislating or anything else. Frankly, I, I find them to be fairly useless um, as far as what the goals of Congress are as an institution, uh, and definitely not something that Congress was designed really to, to deal with. Um, now, between those three things, I think you can have a discussion, the, the sort of three legitimate things that I, that I sort of asserted at the beginning there. I think you can have an argument as to which of those things are most important. I'm actually somebody that believes stuff like going to Eagle Scout meetings and pancake breakfast and that sort of thing. I don't think that stuff should be eliminated because that's very important to the trust dynamic we talked about earlier. I think it can be abused, of course, as it was in the 70s and 80s by some members. Um, but but I think that there's there's legitimacy to all three things. I just don't think we're doing enough of, of any of them right now. Got it. So next question is really about debate, uh, deliberation, dialogue. How should that occur or be structured in Congress? You know, should it be in committee? Should it be on the floor? Should it be in the back room? Should it be at the bar? And how does this happen? How should it happen, I should say? So uh, as we've discussed sort of throughout this conversation, there are macro level factors that are going to prevent what I'm about to say from happening, but I really think we'd benefit from going back to a system wherever we have strong committees and that is where most of your deliberation occurs. Uh, there's two, re two main reasons I think this is useful for us in this present moment. One is the efficiency gains from specialization. Um, whenever you allow people to delve deeply into one area uh, rather than be a you know, master of nothing, I think you get better policy overall. But the other thing that I think is given a little bit short shrift when you think about committees is that it really segments controversy rather than folding everything into one big ideological or partisan war of all against all. You know, parties can segment things, or sorry, committees can segment things in a way that I, do, I don't think that we have right now, but that I think could be uh, really, really beneficial. Because right now what we have a lot of is performance art, um, especially on, on the floor. Um, you, you see, you know, two minute speeches on this or one minute speech on that. That's, that's not debate. That's not deliberation. That is speaking in sound bites. Um, and uh, what we really need is a focused conversation aimed at your colleagues, not at your primary voters back home or funders um, that's designed on, on problem solving. Um, you know, it, you know, has, televi has televising stuff changed things and stuff? Maybe. I think it's impossible to know that. Um, but really what I think the bigger problem is, is that this, this broader party competition that has really tied us in knots in so many ways, but including in terms of communications. So, and in terms of the location, it sounds like the committee where the expertise is, is where you see this dialogue happening. You know, if it were private instead of public, do you think that would move the needle on improving the dialogue? You know, th there's, there's definitely this hypothesis out there. I've been thinking a lot about how one could actually test this, you know, do, do cameras make people more venomous and, and that kind of thing. And I, I've been talking with some colleagues about maybe those, if there's a way we can test this, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that C-SPAN was founded by uh, Brian Lamb, Purdue graduate, the Purdue, uh, the Lamb School of Communications is here, the C-SPAN archives are here. So we love C-SPAN here. Uh, and I think it's in our interest and everybody's interest to know what effect it has had. Um, I, it's it's hard for me to know because right now what we're seeing is they're spending less time with each other both in Congress and outside of Congress. Uh, they're going back to the district more and that's one thing, but they're spending so much time with fundraisers and fundraisers are now so much more tied to individual parties. To your point earlier, you know, the, these rich folks that want to invest in think tanks, you would think they're outcome driven, but really they're just as partisan as everyone else. So there's not, you're not even seeing each other at thousand of dollar a plate lunches or whatever. I'm sure it's more than a thousand dollars, whatever it is, it's above my pay grade, but um, you don't even see this sort of, I guess, moneyed interest overlap that you once did. So it's hard for me to say whether it would help because I just don't see where it's going to happen. You don't even, I mean, you go around the hill to all the usual places. What's that one restaurant, Tortilla Coast and stuff like that. I mean, you don't even see people, uh, is Tortilla Coast still there? I don't know. Um, but it used to, you know, even 10 years ago, you would see, you know, Democrat and Republican at the same table. I just don't get the sense you see that as much anymore. Yeah. Next question is what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? 
as I mentioned before, I, I think top two primary is really interesting, uh, and I've done work on it. I think that you know that maybe not term limits, but other ways of of creating turnover could be good. But I, um, given that, that that this question is really about the long term, and given Sunwater's interest in the long term. As I've noted throughout this conversation, I really think a lot of our problems are not easy fixes. They're fundamental system level problems that everybody is responding to. And so to solve those kinds of problems, you need fundamental institution, institutional changes. So I'm going to throw out a solution that is likely to be unpopular and that one that I, I, I would love to be shown that I'm wrong about this. I've not heard anyone say this but me. Um, which probably means it's a bad idea, but here we go. I think we need to have fewer elections. Uh, I think that two-year elections is way, way, way too many. And the reason is I think so many of our challenges, both things that the people hate about Congress as well as things that political scientists and economists hate about Congress, really all have a root cause, which is this electoral pressure, this partisan competition in the era of insecure majorities. And so it's not really the traditional legislator constituency pressure, but the constant worry and striving over majority control. So just think about it for a second, all the things that people hate about Congress. The people, they hate the fundraising and the kowtowing to unrepresentative rich individuals. Well, guess what? Party competition has made it such that even people in state districts have to fundraise so that you can put it in the leadership packs, right? People hate the vitriol and the distinction drawing between the parties, but you're a businessman. You know that in any competitive market, good branding draws distinction between my product and your product. So the vitriol is part and parcel of competition. Political scientists hate gridlock and dysfunction. But again, I've shown this is a necessary outgrowth of power centralization. And they also hate divestment and expertise. But again, if party leaders want to control information, the best way to do it is to centralize expertise and, and create incentives to not invest in it. So all of these problems that we point to, I really think have very similar root causes. And if you space out your elections a little bit more, you turn down the heat in Washington and in the country, you make room for deliberation and coalition building, all the stuff that you need to solve problems in a separation of power system. And so maybe what we really need are four-year terms that coincide with presidential elections. Um, again, you know, as we sort of talked about previously, people say you want less democracy. Maybe that's the case. Um, but I really think we need to, 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 to lower the heat a little bit. And I, I so I, I have a prop here because if you don't want to take my word for it, I want you to take Madison's word for it. Now, I'm, I'm going to read to you from Federalist 53. I got my Bible, aka the Federalist Papers here with me. One of the great controversies about the Constitution was that the House of Representatives had two-year terms instead of the much more popular one-year terms. So we think of two-year terms as short. They were actually twice as long as what the people at that time wanted, right? So in Federalist 53, here's what Madison says about his, his and it really was sort of his decision, to have these two-year terms. He says, no man can be a competent legislator who does not add to an upright intention and a sound judgment a certain degree of the knowledge of the subjects on which he is to legislate. A part of this knowledge may be acquired by means of information which lie within the compass of men in private as well as public stations. But another part can only be attained, or at least thoroughly attained, by the actual experience in the station which requires the use of it. The period of service ought therefore, in all such cases, to bear some proportion to the extent of practical knowledge requisite to the due performance of the service. Now, I, you know, I, I would love for someone to volunteer to say that the, uh, that the proportion of the extent of practical knowledge needed today in today's complicated system uh, is actually less than 1787. I think we all know the world is more complicated complicated than it was then for a variety of reasons. And so I don't think it's crazy at all from the founder's perspective for us to want to increase term length for the very same reasons that they effectively increase term length. Excellent. Appreciate that point of view. Um, in terms, I mean, you just read from the Federalist Papers, but my next question is which book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? Well, you know, the, the Federalist, if I can't start a paper or a book with the Federalist Papers, I'm generally not all that interested, uh, in part because we're so lucky to have the thoughts of the designers of our system, the, 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 the writers of the rules of the game written down for us. And it's just an amazing resource. 
Uh, but if I go with something more contemporary, I would say the book would undoubtedly be Francis Lee's Insecure Majorities. That should surprise no one if they've made it this far in, in our conversation. Uh, an article, uh, though, that has been tremendously influential to me, particularly on the private interest side, is an annual review of political science article by uh, Paul Pearson and Eric Schickler called Madison's Constitution Under Distress, a Developmental Analysis of Political Polarization. This is a review article, so it's very accessible. Um, and it encapsulates, of course, um, especially with Dr. Pearson, we've discussed a lot of similar ideas over the last two years. It really encapsulates a lot of, of my worry and as well as, of course, their worry about where we're at in terms of the constitution we're supposed to have with the society that we've inherited. Right, well, my last question is really about your, your uh, perspective for the long run. What, what are you working on now and what do you have coming in the future? Yeah, so, uh, so I'm at the stage, I would say, in my career where I'm taking a lot of my paper length projects um, and really turning them into book length treatments. That's a variety of reasons. So one of the side benefits is it gives me the opportunity to build very large data sets that can be a public good for scholars, uh, for reformers, and, and for Congress itself, I hope. Um, and, and so that's a really nice benefit to it. The other reason is in a political science article, you don't really have time to uh, pontificate about how you would change things or what might be a useful reform, book length things really do give you the opportunity to do that. And so that's my hope in doing that. So we already have a book project around uh, sort of mission creep and interest groups and party competition, which we talked about earlier. Uh, but the plan also is to write a book about the evolution of expertise and its use in Congress uh, with Tim Lapira. Uh, where we're just at the start right now of a big data collection of um, the, the portfolios, uh, the issue portfolios of staffers going back into the into the 1970s. So uh, looking to expand my work there. I should also say I, I'm still interested in expanding my work on the top two primary, talked with a lot of people about different types of systems, um, some old, some new. So that's been a very fun space uh, to be in. There's a lot of energy there. And of course, state legislatures are a little bit more active than Congress is in terms of actually changing policy. So there's the sort of added dimension of like the stuff that we talk about might actually happen, which is always exciting. So I would say those are sort of the three main areas that I've been working in. Excellent. Well, Professor Carlson, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and best of luck with the work. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to have a conversation. It's been a, a lot of fun.